personal decision, motivating factors in right to die cases. I'm Megan. And I'm Maria. And we're going to be talking to you today about the controversial topic of human euthanasia. So this past fall, Maria and I were in looking at the new news article about Brittany Maynard and the fact about assisted assist, physician-assisted suicide. And that is human euthanasia when a, human or a person chooses to end their life. So before, I mean, human euthanasia has been around for a while now, but it's been on the back burner of like the news sphere just because it's just accepted and like socially like, acknowledged that it's not something you do because a doctor is usually usually just tries to like do whatever you can as whatever means necessary to save your life. So this fall, Brittany Maynard, she's a young woman. She became the young, like young and attractive became the face of the human euthanasia movement. And she made national news because she faced all sorts of resistance from different groups like religious groups or political groups that condemned her choice to end her life um, this, in October. So we're both interested in medical careers, so we really were interested in this topic because um, we wanted to look at the ethical considerations of human euthanasia and like what implications it um, we need to take into account like when looking at the knowledge issues. Uh, we also wanted to look at the factors behind a person's decision when choos choosing to end their life. And we, they often face different resistance from those different groups I mentioned previously. And we wanted to look at the, explore the nature of those inf influences when a person is deciding whether to end their life. So you guys aren't really familiar with the theory of knowledge vocabulary, but all types of knowledge can fall into different subject categories called areas of knowledge. And human euthanasia is going to fall under the natural sciences as it is a medical treatment, but we will also be discussing examples pertaining to euthanasia in the areas of religion and human sciences. So to start off, I want to give you guys a little bit more detail about Brittany Maynard's case. Um, so Maynard's case was the most prominent um, case associated with human euthanasia in recent years, and it really brought national attention onto the right to die movement. So last January, Brittany Maynard was diagnosed with likely stage four glioblastoma, which is a type of brain cancer. In April, doctors told her that she had six months left to live. So with this terminal diagnosis, uh, Maynard knew that the quality of her life would only continue to deteriorate over the next six months um, as her body deteriorated, and she would have to go un undergo difficult chemotherapy, um, which would lead to pain and dependence on her family members, which wouldn't be a good situation for anyone involved. So she decided to look into avenues in California, the state where she lived, that would allow her to end her life on her own terms, since her death was already um, inevitable and imminent. Um, but she found that human euthanasia was not legal in California, and it still isn't today. So she relocated with her husband to Oregon, which is one of five states with right-to-die policies. In Oregon, it's called the Death with Dignity Act, and it allowed her to die peacefully in her bedroom on the day of her choice, surrounded by her loved ones. So a little bit more about Oregon's, Oregon's Death with Dignity Act. It was enacted in 1997, and it allows terminally ill residents of Oregon to uh, end their lives with a lethal dose of medica medication expressly prescribed by a physician for that purpose. So she was prescribed a pill, and she was able to keep it with her until the time that she felt comfortable before she had to go through the physical and psychological trauma that comes with dying of cancer. So just some more definitions before we get more into the topic of human euthanasia and the theory of knowledge aspect that we're bringing up. So voluntary euthanasia is when a competent person makes a voluntary and enduring request to uh, be helped to die. And so this can be done through various methods like lethal injections or suspension of medical treatment like life support. Um, choosing to take, be taken off life support would be, like, be the same thing as choosing to end their lives. Another definition would be physician-assisted suicide. Suicide accomplished with the aid of a medical doctor intentionally providing a person with an overdose of prescription me medication. Like a high dose of morphine is often prescribed to some people um, who wish to end their lives. So when these two top um, definitions of terms aren't mutually exclusive, that means they are often like interchanged, not necessarily interchanged, but like you can volunteer. Physician-assisted suicide, suicide is like 
underneath voluntary euthanasia. So when we refer to euthanasia, we're going to be talking about physician-assisted suicide, where a doctor is expressly prescribing a medication to a patient to, uh, to end their lives. So part more about the theory of knowledge aspect of our presentation, we want to talk about personal versus shared knowledge. So personal knowledge refers to the claims and understanding we hold as individuals. They include our deepest held beliefs and values. They are understood in the context of our experiences and memories which shape and develop them. Shared knowledge is that held by a larger group. So in the case of personal and shared knowledge, personal knowledge is like saying I know, and while shared knowledge is like saying we know. So together, shared knowledge is produced as a society, as a product of a group of individuals. It's often associated with like cultural, like indigenous knowledge system, indigenous knowledge system, or like religious knowledge system. And those are various areas of knowledge that we're going to be talking about. It's usually socially established and highly structured. It evolves over time. It could be either slow or something like sudden, like a paradigm shift or something like that. So we wanted to examine how these shared knowledge, like this, or shared knowledge bases, or whether knowledge acquired from a personal experience takes precedence in cases like hu of human euthanasia. Like, is it right? And whether one should be like better or like which one should be, which one should have authority in the ultimate decision to end a person's life. And that leads us to our knowledge question, which is, should either shared or personal knowledge take precedence in decisions pertaining to life and death? And we wanted to look at how these various shared knowledge bases that we talked about affect an individual's decision to end their life, and does society have the right to even have an influence in an individual's decision to end their life? So in Brittany Maynard, she, had, she chose to end her life due to personal convictions. And although she faced lots of resistance from society and various groups, like religious groups and stuff, um, she chose to end, uh, end her life <coughs> instead of conforming to societal pressures. But in any case, should restrictions be placed on an individual to end their life? Um, and I want to link our knowledge question a little bit more to the real life situation of human euthanasia. So, medicine has made it possible for us to have a greater degree of control over how and when we die. And as Megan said, this has led to clashes with the beliefs of larger societal entities like the government or religious bodies. Because the shared knowledge standard set up by these um, societal entities evolves slowly, so their knowledge bases tend to be more conservative, um, and therefore opposes new technologies and options like human euthanasia. So these shared knowledge systems build societal standards such as a sense of morality or a sense of what is right and wrong. In addition to that, humans already have an innate fear of death and suicide is definitely a taboo in Western culture. So all of this leads to our society tending to categorize human euthanasia as something that is wrong or unnatural. But there have been a bunch of individuals in recent years, and Brittany Maynard is only one of them that we will discuss, that says that this is their body and this is their fate. So if they are going to die and it's inevitable and they don't want to go through all of that pain, they have the right to take advantage of any options made possible by science that would allow them to better determine what is going to happen to their body. But it must be kept in mind that we do live in a framework of shared knowledge. So we trust groups like religious bodies and the government to protect us, to guide us in what is right and wrong, but death is a very personal decision. So like Megan is saying, was saying earlier, um, this presentation is about exploring how those two um, factors behind these decisions sort of interact in a decision that is personal, but definitely something that is important um, in the shared knowledge aspect of society. So does anyone have any like preliminary thoughts or opinions concerning? Um, my cousin's in the Air Force, and there was one time that someone at his base attempted suicide. So they put him on suicide watch, and my cousin was one of the people who had to watch him. But the people who had to watch him, they were all really annoyed at having to do this. So they basically cursed him out so bad that the guy who was planning to do suicide went to his commander and said that he wasn't going to do it just as long as they took him off suicide watch. And to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't attempted suicide again after that. So I would say that society managed to save a life by denying him that right. So. That's a good point. I think a lot of due to like medical circumstances is, 
I imagine it okay because you're, like you said, the quality of life whenever you're diagnosed with a terminal condition goes down really quickly. And uh, forcing someone to live with that much pain and the knowledge that they're eventually going to die, if they have no control over it, is, in my opinion, a, cool, a crueler thing to do than letting them choose when they can die. Um, personal experience is usually um, created through interaction with like a society. So would that not imply that like the society's influence would greatly affect their decision? Definitely, definitely. Yes, all personal knowledge is definitely shaped by the shared knowledge through which you um, view the world. But in cases of terminally ill people, they have this personal experience that the rest of society can't really relate to. You know, so how does that? When you have these shared knowledge bases that are shaping how you view the world and how you view yourself and your position in the world. How does that interplay with this like horrible experience that not a lot of other people can relate to? You know, so that's what we're asking. Steph, um, I think that if you're terminally ill, then it's okay to commit suicide because it is your life, like you said. But if you're just doing it on your own, maybe like your friends and family should help you seek a little more guidance before you like take to the decision because it is your life, and I think that it's completely your right to do what you want. But maybe seeking guidance would be a better option. Okay. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that personal knowledge should take precedence in situations like this if it involves a person like it's like having it's worse than having a better life by killing themselves. Like if obviously like if they're terminally ill or they're on life support, then they should be able to make the decision to have the assisted suicide. But like on the other hand, if there is a chance for them to like get better, whether it's medically or like mentally, then shared knowledge take precedence in making the decision, whereas it maybe should not be allowed to make the decision. Yeah, it's definitely a fine line to walk between the sanctity of life and saving a life at all costs versus you know doing what is better for like a mental well-being. So, um, so there's like what also there's another question um, like what if like, the person is in like coma or something? And they, there's a possibility that they will live, like, I don't know, for like, decades yet, but there's no way that they're going to wake up. Like, there's no way that they can make that decision, so who is allowed to make the decision to take them off life support? Yeah, that was one of the examples, actually, that we, we didn't, we're not talking about in our presentation, but we, when we were researching, um, like, our little kids is the same thing. Like, who has a decision for these little kids? If they're going to be terminally ill and only have, like, a couple years to live, is it right to let them suffer through that, their disease or illness? So, that's um, Actually, when I was little, doctors told me that, doctors told my parents that I wasn't going to live. I was about two months old, and there was a doctor that actually refused to operate on me. She, he told Jane that he should just com like, get me comforted while I die. Obviously, that doctor was wrong, so I kind of biased on this. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you're of the mind that anything should be done to save a life because you never know there's a chance that the terminal diagnosis is wrong. Yeah. Um, what you said was that like people, like the society isn't experiencing like the same personal experiences, but like there's many people who have like the same personal experience, like with like Brittany Maynard, like she had like brain cancer. There's like a there's not, like a like a society of like people with like, brain cancer who like, yeah. meet like people who have, like so why wasn't she exposed to like that sort of society instead of just, uh, Do you think that they should make the decision? I didn't say that. I said it's all about the influence from yeah, the society. Yeah, definitely. Like, maybe that would have made her psychological journey a little easier yeah. if she had, was exposed to a different shared knowledge framework. Um, okay, well. So I guess the thing is that there's always a chance that in those months that you would have lived that there's some sort of scientific or medical breakthrough that would save your life. And then at that point, if you do choose to end your own life, it's too late, it's irreversible, and it's too late to kind of save yourself. So it should be presented as an option, but like there are definitely a lot of possible outcomes. I guess most people who would ask for euthanasia feel that the psychological trauma of what they are about to experience is enough to eclipse the possibility of, you know, potentially maybe there's a 1% chance of a treatment later on, but it's, it's not going to save them all the stress of their diagnosis in the present. So, 
Uh, we want to first want to look at sociocultural beliefs. So these shared knowledge systems that we've been talking about, like societal pressures, they create these certain standards and expectations that individuals of a society tend to conform to and feel the pressure to conform to. So how do sociocultural beliefs serve as a knowledge base when making decisions concerning life and death? How does or even should these societal pressures impact our decisions? So we talked about um, our new discussion before this, like with him, you have talked about um, that it should because we should do all cost, like do whatever costs necessary to save a life. But if affecting a personal decision like your own life, is that necessarily the right thing to do? And how much pressure should society force an individual to continue living um, instead of choosing death? So like Maria mentioned earlier, choosing death has been is a social taboo. It's not something we're uncomfortable to accept death. And oftentimes, like the idea of being able to choose our own death, like when and how we die, is something that we can't really think of uh, together as a society, and that creates a sort of knowledge, a shared knowledge base too. And so we acquire these norms that we think of like as a society through these shared knowledge bases, but do they ultimately have authority over questions about life and death? So there are various government uh, shared knowledge bases like legal and political aspects that create these set of rules and expectations for us that ultimately guide our society and what our pressures or our beliefs when concerning our, like, our original framework, I guess. And it's a, formed as a result of a group of people, which is the definition of shared knowledge. So one of the cases I wanted to look at was, we wanted to look at was C. Rudd So in 1991, a British Columbian woman was diagnosed with ALS, which is that amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with from the summer. Um, and so she, in the Criminal Code of Canada, it was in, in Canada, uh, assisted suicide was legal, uh, illegal, and you would be punished with 14 years in prison. So she took the case to the Supreme Court to try to appeal for assisted suicide. Um, it was unsuccessful by right, the Supreme Court of Canada, and they said that the time and manner, um, well, Sue Rodriguez said the time and manner of her death shouldn't matter and shouldn't be guided by the law or, um, a, or her disease, and that's why she wanted to take her own life. And although she was incapable of doing it herself with her disease, she thought it should be legal that a doctor should be able to help her with this suicide. So on September 30th, in 1993, British the Supreme Court ruled against her five to four uh, in Rodriguez versus, versus British Columbia. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the government ideals and with the sanctity of life. They said that no matter what the cost is, the, the duty of Canadian, like the doctors, are supposed to preserve the life no matter what. And so there are two things we wanted to look at regarding the Supreme Court case was that the government has the duty to protect all the citizens uh, and preserve the sanctity of life. And the Charter of Rights and Freedoms champions an individual's right to life, liberty, and the security of life, or security of a person. And that not necessarily means the right to choose death. And so I think Sue Rodriguez, concerning this case, was like, if I have the right to my life, that should mean control over my body. But um, she didn't win her case. So to keep in mind, Sue Rodriguez did have the right to commit suicide. That was expunged from the criminal code in the 70s. But with her condition at, with ALS, she was un, like not physically capable to do that on her own. And she needed the help, which, which was legal. So, oh wait. So that was just one. All right, so I'd like to bring it to faith-based shared knowledge now. Um, religion is one of the largest and most influential shared knowledge bases in our society. Uh, so faith is a way of knowing that is used to construct religious knowledge. And religion is different from other areas of knowledge in that spiritual beliefs are not universally accept accepted. There are tons of different perceptions about what God is and what role God has in our lives. Um, in addition to that, it, religion is based on belief built through faith and not facts or evidence built through reason. But despite that, it's still a very, it plays a really large part in our lives because it is also built on emotion, which is another way of knowing. People are very emotionally tied to their religion because it gives their life a sense of purpose. It tells them what is right, what is wrong, sort of a moral compass. And also, um, God's, the idea of God's plan plays into a lot of um, like Western religions and the idea that we are on earth working 
toward a greater end. God put us here to like live out his work and then we will be rewarded with like the heavenly kingdom. So that sort of soothes our fears about death and the afterlife. And because tradition and loyalty to belief is so key to religion, the area of religion tends to oppose deviations to traditional shared knowledge, making it more of a reactionary force in our society. And because religion engenders such a deep attachment and loyalty, people sometimes make decisions based off of their spiritual belief, even above their own personal experiences. I know a lot of people who really live their lives by their religion, and they don't want to oppose the spiritual traditions of the religion they adhere to, even if, when it comes to their own death. So the stalwart nature of religion demonstrates how prescribed beliefs can sometimes overcome personal experience. And now I'd like to look specifically at the Catholic Church. Um, it's the largest Christian denomination, and it is notorious for being sort of a conservative faith body. So the Pope Francis recently denounced the Right to Die movement, calling human euthanasia a false act of compassion. And I think it's noteworthy that he used the word compassion because it suggests that the church views euthanasia as something done to a patient rather than a personal decision by that patient. So it, that already speaks to like a deeper conflict where they see physician-assisted suicide as a killing rather than someone just choosing the manner of death that they feel is right for them. Um, and Catholics do believe that life is God's creation and should not be taken into human hands. They think that it's a sin to manipulate God's plan for our lives. Like I was saying earlier, they believe that we are put on earth to do God's work and we will be called back to God when his plan for us is done. And it's considered to flouting that plan if we control our own death. And that's why suicide is a very big sin in Catholicism. Brittany Nader counteracted that idea, saying that cancer is what's killing her. She is not killing herself. Um, so she justified her case of human euthanasia in that way because her death was imminent, and since it's her body, she wanted to just do it on her own terms. But do you think that people should have to justify their decisions to fit... Go ahead. Do you think that people should have to justify their decisions to fit with broader bodies of shared knowledge in their society. Sarah? I think that if you are Catholic and you want to die when you're supposed to die, then you should do that. But I don't think that you should push your beliefs on to someone else. I think that it should be up to the person who is dying. I don't think that it should be taken into other people's hands. I think it should be um, only based on what that person wants. Jeanette? Well, considering that, like, if you are a Catholic and you're, like, say you're deeply religious, like, that is your knowledge base of, like, what you're basing your decision on, basically. So I do think that if you're that kind of person, you're deeply religious, and, like, your whole life has been based on that body of knowledge, religious body of knowledge, that your decision should be should justified, reflect. so they should reflect yeah. that to fit in with your religion, because that's, like, well, if that's who you are, I mean, you can obviously change that, but I think that you should justify your decisions based on your shared knowledge in that sense. Yes. Um, the whole point of, like, I was trying to think about was, like, um, that suicide is, like, assisted suicide is kind of its own category towards, like, like death, in a sense, because, like, suicide is killing yourself, homicide is killing someone else. So, like, it's sort of, like, mixed between because it's their choice, but it's someone else acting upon them. Is that kind of why, like, they're condemning it because it's both murder and suicide, I think? Yes, although in the Catholic Church, both homicide and suicide are condemned, so... That's what it's like, especially. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this broad question that you have up here, mm -hmm. and if the answer is no, then you're basically advocating anarchy, because if you have government, if you have states that protect the rights of citizens, then people are going to have to justify their decisions to fit with shared knowledge. If you, now, I think the real question is if you have to justify the specific decision of your death, whether that should be one of the things over which government has power. And with that, I think that our right to life and the government should protect our life over our liberty. 
And there's a reason why that's put first in the Constitution before that. Good point. Yeah, Megan was talking about that in the Sue Rodriguez case. One of the reasons that she was unsuccessful in the Supreme Court was because the Canadian government believes that they are protecting sanctity of life. You know, so, good point. Um, sorry. Another thing was like, this like isn't limited to death. Like the issue of abortion and stuff. Like this, this it's the same argument. Like, should the government have that authority over someone's body? Like not just death, but like abortion. Just like, just in general, um, these body of shared knowledge they form these frameworks that we as citizens of a government or like of a state need to conform to. And so on certain decisions, like we talk, we're talking about human euthanasia, a physician assisted suicide, is it right for people to have to justify based on a greater shared knowledge, like justify their personal decision based on their own experience with a shared knowledge, like body system? So, so sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, I feel like any kind of suicide is completely a personal decision. We don't necessarily with what the rest of like um, even your friends think. Um, it's yeah, it's personal knowledge. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be shared knowledge. So you don't agree that it that it must be justified to prevent sort of like an anarchy in society where everyone is just doing like really nearly like okay. Do you think I mean it's not necessarily like extended to that extreme okay. but over doing that um you I mean okay. so it's just, like if you're a Catholic and you're terminally ill, like maybe your personal decision would be to end your life, to avoid that much pain. Like, I don't know yeah. what other people would think, but. Okay. But you believe that if that's what someone who adheres to the Catholic faith wants to do, they shouldn't feel that the denunciation by the Pope is an obstacle to that personal choice. Yeah, obviously if that's what they believe, then that's their right. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I agree with Zosha. I think when it comes to things like assisted suicide, and if you're terminally ill, I think if you want to end your life with personal knowledge, you definitely take more importance than the shared knowledge because it is your decision, it is your life, and whether you go through that pain is dependent on you if you want to end it. Andrew, last one. All right, uh, I'll make this quick. I was going to say with the, the context of uh, answering no to this question would just be a result of anarchy. Instead of justifying someone's decision to uh, uh, end their life, it's instead could just be protected. And I think this is actually done uh, very well in the United States Constitution under the Ninth Amendment by reserving these rights to the individual personally, and that it's not exactly acting as a legislating tool by the government, but instead as a protection to the right to choice in these decisions. This can be done without directly legislating what someone should do, but instead protecting their rights. So just like religion is a body, a governing body, and like the Sue Rodriguez case that I talked about earlier but about the Canadian government ruling that she, a physician assisted suicide, with doctors itself, the American Medical Association is the largest association of physicians in the United States. So the physicians are the ones who are prescribing these drugs to the patients who wish to end their lives. And so this group of medical experts, they have to consider these ethical implications that we're discussing here about is it right to uh, give a lethal dose of medication to a patient to, who wish to end, end their life? And so the AMA's official policy is that physician assisted suicide is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as a healer. So euthanasia is hastening death. Um, and that's something that doesn't bode well when we think we hear that. So hastening death, that means speaking of death, that we aren't comfortable with that, just like we aren't comfortable with suicide in general. So it's just like not what we think about. And so that's why the American Medical Association feels that it just doesn't fit as a physician's role as a healer. But doesn't the physician also have a role to assist the patient in whatever they feel is right for their body? And so they have this brings up the ethical considerations in the natural sciences. So does society or an individual have the right to hasten death? Um, there's been these great advances in medical knowledge that can help us choose how and when we die. And so that comes with a great power, which is why medical doctors like the AMA have to consider these implications. So I don't know if you know about this, but the doctors, they often take this Hippocratic Oath, and that's just like something that's been done for a while, and it says that uh, no matter what, you do whatever means necessary to take, save the life of a patient, and that is countered with human euthanasia. So the American Medical Association and the Canadian government, 
our, uh, the government system in general, and religious knowledge system, they all pose these different um, obstacles when an individual chooses to end their life. So we w wanted to ask the question, what authority does a ruling government have over life? So just like our, the previous question we were talking about, do we have to justify our decisions based to our like a form of shared knowledge? Do these, does the ruling government have the right to set these rules and reg regulations over an individual's right to their own life or their own death? And so in the case of C. Rodriguez, the Canadian Supreme Court had ruled on the collect duty and collective responsibility of Canadi the Canadian citizens to preserve life. And that's um, part of shared knowledge. And they ruled that as a person of a degenerated in in and incapacitated Incapacitating disease, ALS, um, C. Rodriguez didn't have the right to consent to her own death. So she said, if I cannot give consent to my own death, whose body is this? Who owns my life? And so I know we were talking about this earlier, but can a shared knowledge system, like a legal, like the legal system of Canada, or the, a religious body system like the Catholic Church, or even the American Medical Association of like Physicians, do they have a, the right to force a person, if they're suffering, in, with their own pain to live and continue living if they choose not to. And so the power of these governing systems, governing societal knower groups, they create knowledge systems like legal, religious, or medical, and they create the set of standards and expectations that as individuals we are expected to follow. And the, these predetermined beliefs ultimately shape our in, or influence our decision to um, choose life or death. Or for one, in the case of the Catholic Church, I think that's kind of a non-issue because if you're a Catholic and you want to commit suicide, no one in the church is actually going to go and physically stop you. That's true. But you will feel the conflict between your beliefs and that will pose an obstacle. That's just a part of being in society. <laughs> right. So that's what like our question is. How does society influence our personal decisions? So can these, because oftentimes like we're limited by what our government says we can and cannot do. So in all but five states here in the United States, we aren't able to commit, or a physician, can, physician cannot prescribe drugs or lethal dose of medications to kill yourself. So um, we so have to So what's more important, life or liberty? <laughs> I think um, society calls physicians healers. I think that there is a distinct difference between mental healing and physical healing. If you can't physically heal a person, and if you know assisting them in suicide will give them some mental relief, and then they will have to go through that pain, and I think that's still healing. I don't think that you know society should say that they're not doing their job as healers, because that's not really a, a fair statement. Very good point. But even among the terminally ill patients that have undergone human euthanasia in the United States, most of them actually cited psychological reasons as um, the motive behind choosing that instead of just natural death. Like, it's not that the pain from their chemotherapy or their cancer was unbearable and they didn't think they could live with it. It was just the trauma of them and their families having to go through like that downward spiral. So do you think that um, there should, before human euthanasia is allowed, they should go to all like psychological recourses to try to overcome that mental trauma? You know? I mean, if they if they would prefer to, I think I think I still think that's up to them. If they have decided, if they made their decision, then you know, then no. But if they are like, well, you know, if you know, they should confer with their loved ones and say, like, you know, if you want me to live for these last couple of months, it might be painful for both of us. But if it's you know, if they're like, no, then we want that time with you, then you know, I think it's up to them. Yeah. Well, we have to like the authority that like governments or whatever like society has of the. Decisions. I think that society helps us establish the morals that we're um, like obviously going to use to make the decisions. So I think like rather than like society saying like no, like flat out saying you can't like assist your like you can't have assisted suicide. I think that they're we're having a sense of like ethics or morals like instilled in us, whereas like that's kind of like it's like an inward authority where like they're not directly saying you can't do this, but like we have the morals inside of us that say that. Maybe I should do this. Yes. Um, so I think, uh, like by choosing to like, just just by being a part of the society, you have to like comply with it, or else, like it's it's important to 
conform with society and sometimes even if it's like your own decision sometimes like it's you know, you have to listen sometimes too. yeah right because like we trust our government we as citizens of the United States we have we have faith in our constitution we have we put our belief in like our leaders and stuff and so should that ultimately be like part of like what you're saying sometimes you just like conform to those societies because you you put your trust in them, so why wouldn't you listen to them for in cases like this, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's really one of the things that you look at here, and I agree with that, is of course they have the authority to impose these things. doesn't necessarily make it right. You know, the AMA has the right to revoke someone's medical license if they, if they do this. You know, the Catholic Church has the right to excommunicate someone if they do this. The government has the right to put someone in prison. This is not necessarily the correct moral answer that, you know, I or anyone else may agree with, but of course they have the right to do it. But oftentimes it's up to people like Ms. Rodriguez to fight these kinds of things, you know, and try to get, or, or like even, um, you know, to, you know, might not be the best example, even someone like Kevorkian, who actually went out, and uh, even though it was illegal, and I believe all 50 states at the time actually committed many of these um, you know, uh, doctors to suicides, because he fundamentally believed it was the right to do that, even if it was not, even if it was something that was under the authority of the government, this was illegal. So you, even if, you know, so like I said, of course they have the authority to do this, but it's up to people to actually, if they feel otherwise, to oppose these things. Because if you don't have that, then you know you do run into issues. So if, you know, if they don't have the authority to say yes or no, who, you know, yes. what other authority will it be eventually referred to? Because eventually everything's going to have authority somewhere. I think so. those individual actions of nonconformity are what spark the evolution of shared knowledge into something that is more compatible with the changes that society has been making. Um, yeah, I guess it's like if somebody is just so physically ill that they're physically incapable of basically doing anything, like they have to just like, they're confined to like just a wheelchair or a room or something, then they should have the ability to choose whether or not they want to keep going like that because there's like no, there's very little point in just continuing to live because that's basically not even living. You're just kind of doing nothing and wasting away. I guess that point, like you said, like doing nothing is like living. Well, living is something. Like some people like see that as like strength for like other things. Like you can push through. Like some like miracles happen sometimes. These surgeries come out, they could be bionics and who knows. But why would you not like take the risk and wait it versus just ending it all then? So going off of like this point of like personal decisions Let's talk about personal experience. <laughs> so we've been covering, you know, the different shared knowledge bases in society that affect um, life and death decisions. So I want to turn it toward someone who is who can share with us a bit about um, a personal experience and the individual factors that were incorporated into his decision. And this will help us answer the question: Should personal knowledge be the ultimate contributor contributor to a decision regarding life and death? Okay. So specifically, I wanted to talk about the case of Dr. Donald Lowe. Um, he was a well-known microbiologist in Canada, which as we know by now, um, human euthanasia is illegal there. And he's unique in that he is a member of the medical com community that supports physician-assisted suicide um, for some of the reasons that Sarah was actually mentioning earlier. Mental healing is just as important as saving and preserving the physical body to him. So. We'd like to show a video about his perspective and discuss it. And there's no speaker, so you'll have to be. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. It is his final message to the world, recorded just eight days before he died. The life doctor Donald Lowe was one of this country's leading microbiologists, best known for his pivotal role in guiding Toronto through the SARS crisis. But it is the candid interview he gave before his death from brain cancer that has put him front and center now. In it, Dr. Lowe makes it a passion plea for the right to die with dignity, to be able to, as he says, make the decision himself when enough is enough. To try on now on a doctor's powerful plea. This is how most remember Dr. Donald Lowe, the man with a skip in his step and the utmost authority on keeping Canadians. 
Dr. Donald Lowe made a very poignant point about how if people who oppose physician-assisted suicide experience 24 hours in his body, their opinions might be changed. So if someone says that their suffering is bad enough to justify voluntary suicide, can society <coughs> argue with that personal conviction? Does anyone have an opinion on that? Yes? Um, I think society can't really argue against that because only the person themselves know what they've gone through, and only they can see from their own eyes. Yes. Personal conviction can basically apply to almost all situations that like involve personal experience because it's because of that conviction that they do things. Like why you chose this topic might be like a personal conviction or like family member or it's like some story. It's like the whole thing is like you don't. It's all about personal experience and shared experience, like the whole TFK, but they wouldn't really know. Like what their conviction would be unless they said it. So like, they have to like explain everything. Um, I guess. Yes. Well, like from the Catholic point of view, I think that <coughs> if you were to put this in front of the Pope and ask him his opinion, he'd probably invoke Job and say that this was a trial, and say that even though the suffering is great, maybe I wouldn't be strong enough to make the decision that I'm advocating now. But that doesn't mean that. Your decision is right. Very good point. Yes. So I mean, like society really just can't because if somebody's suffering is so bad that they want to just end it, then they are capable of. Then usually they will be capable of doing it themselves, and it, and then it might just be in some painful, just bad way. When if society had supported them. They could have made it much like easier. Right, and like, much in, less like in the Sue Rodriguez case, she wished to, she wanted to, but she was just physically incapable of doing that without help. And with help, it'd be considered physician-assisted suicide or like someone else, like homicide. So that's something that a personal conviction, of a legal government, a government body would, and society would conform or allow these human euthanasia. It would be something that would be more regulated and rather than like something that to go behind, like do it anyway, like you said. Yeah. So personal conviction does seem to be like the loudest voice um, in these victims of terminal illnesses and their decision to attempt to undergo physician-assisted suicide. But um, he made a very good point about religion and how even someone who is not Catholic, but especially if someone is Catholic, if they were to hear that advice from the Pope, I think it would play a large part into their decision as well. And I think a lot of that is that shared knowledge has been built up over like, the entire history of these um, societal entities, like the whole existence of a government and the whole existence of the Catholic Church. And that's a very powerful force um, when you're trying to make even a personal decision. So it's always going to be difficult to balance those two. Really quickly, Janelle, then. Yeah. But like, who are you supposed to believe versus like a physician saying you're going to die versus like the Pope saying it's just a trial? I mean, some people can lose this affiliation. God is like a miracle. Mm -hmm. It depends on the shared knowledge you prescribe to. Did you? Oh, well, I was just gonna say that it's definitely um, a person. It's all. It's really their personal choice. I mean, if they decide to uh, die naturally and go through whatever kind of doctor, then that's their choice. But if they want to end it, then that's also their choice. You, know? you can't force someone to do something that they want to. So just to 
conclude, we just want to, so these socio-cultural knowledge bases that we talked about, religion, governmenting bodies, like even the medical association, they all pose these pose obstacles to end-of-life processes. So um, shared knowledge often provides the first lens we perceive our own experiences through. Like our societal pressure is so influenced, is so great in our lives that we often refer to something when we experience, like we refer to a, a greater body, which is a shared knowledge, when we experience something personally. And so our perceptions as individuals are ultimately influenced by society as a whole. And so these expectations and standards often create, create like judgment, and like that's what we, when we were talking about the Catholics, like when, if we heard the Pope say that, that also would ultimately like contribute to what we decide. So the option of voluntary euthanasia, we have concluded, should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. As we've seen in the classroom discussion, there's really no definitive answer to when it is right or wrong. Um, there is no way to have one blanket policy for when euthanasia is the right choice because everybody has personal, uh, their own personal experience with the illness and def definitely very varied frameworks of shared knowledge that they view their lives through. So rather than personal or shared knowledge taking precedence, we uh, feel that there must be a balance in the interaction of those two types of knowledge. And in order to achieve this balance, there needs to be greater cooperation between the government bodies, physician associations, and the patients. So that neither personal nor shared knowledge, the shared knowledge that uh, structure our society, so that neither of those entities are neglected in such an important decision. So, any final thoughts, comments? Like, it's like, we should be saying, like, it can't be a blanket law. There's no, it has to be, be regarding case by case scenario, because, like, in the case of your brother's friend, like, the suicide watch, like, that's something that can be prevented. And that was one of the things we actually wanted to look at, like, suicide and whether, how we should play on that. So, thank you.